We greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we look around and see the beautiful Christmas season, we know that Betty spent her first Christmas in heaven this year. What a wonderful, blessed thought that is. We gather here today not merely to remember her, though indeed we do, and all of us remember her with great fondness, with great love, because she meant a great deal to each one of us. But we gather here to worship the God whom Betty loved and adored. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. We're so glad that you're able to be with us today for this very sad yet joyous and solemn occasion. If you did not get a copy of the bulletin, it has the list of service today that will be in there. We invite you to bring that with you to the graveside if you're coming to the graveside because at every Bible Presbyterian funeral, we always sing, when the trumpet of the Lord is, shall sound uh, and time shall be no more. And there's a, a copy of that hymn in that bulletin. We'll be singing that at the graveside. And there's one correction to be made. In my tiredness, I typed 505 for the second hymn or third hymn. It should be 705 for it is well with my soul. So when we get to that point, don't think you misheard me. It will be hymn number 705. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we praise you and thank you that you are the God of grace, the God of glory. How we thank you that in your mercy you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, incarnate God, to this earth at this Christmas season. What a blessed time of year. How we thank you, Father, that he lived to manhood in perfection and purity, and then betrayed, was nailed to a cross, where he took upon him the sins of the world. He died in our place, that we, through faith in him, might have forgiveness of sins. And he rose from the dead with power to know that he can give us eternal life when we trust in him. Father, we pray for your blessings upon this service, that Jesus Christ would be uplifted, that he would be honored, that he would be glorified, that he would have the preeminence, for Betty would certainly want it to be that way. And Father, we come to worship you humbly, to adore you, to praise you for the life of this woman who lived for Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for your blessings upon this service, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our hymnals now and we'll turn together to hymn number 572, Blessed Assurance, and we'll stand to sing the first hymn, number 572.
Amen. You may be seated. Whenever we remember a departed loved one, we like to give the opportunity to family and friends to share memories. Something that Betty did that made an impact on your life. Something that you remember about her. Something that you'd like to share that others might know this remarkable woman. And so we have a microphone down here at the front. The mic is on. And uh, we invite you uh, to come up. Just watch. And when you have an opportunity, you may come to the front and give testimony of what Betty meant to you and the impact that she made in your life. You're welcome to come. When we heard the news about Betty's passing, my husband said to me, what is your favorite memory about Betty? That was a terrible, terrible question because I had no idea because as far back as I can remember, she was at every holiday, every birthday, every vacation, every wedding, every graduation, every event in our family. She had many friends across the country and when they would come to visit, we were all included. She was part of our family. She loved music and spent all her years at Collingswood in the choir and later on as the director. On Christmas Eve, 10th Presbyterian, as a lot of you know, I guess, um, they have this really wonderful Christmas Eve service. And if anyone has ever gone, it is so crowded that people just push and shove, and it's just, it's a mass entrance and exodus, and it's really hard to get in. So one year, we were walking up a side street after parking, and at the side door, one of the um, soloists was outside and he was warming up his voice and everything and she she looked around and she says that man must be a professional what a wonderful voice well this man heard her came over and started talking they went chatting on about music he broke us in before the service even started we got to have third row seats at 10th press that was like a miracle and one other memory I wanted to share about her she loved to travel and she visited Nairobi, she visited Africa, she visited South Korea, she went to China, she went to Egypt um, and Israel. And during her Israel trip, Shelton College went and people from Collingswood went. They met here and then they drove up to New York to get, to get on the plate and go to London. Well, in London, I was separated from all the Shelton College people and Betty was in the other group. So we hung out. We spent 10 hours in London driving all around and we saw Westminster Abbey and Piccadilly Circus and we just rode all over the place. We had the grandest time. And once we got to Israel and we were all back together again, we spent, we did spend time. We waited in the Dead Sea. We rode donkeys into Petra. She rode a camel for a short distance. We walked all along the Dolorosa. She just made everything an adventure and had an unwavering amount of energy. There are so many things I want to say about how wonderful she was, but if you're here and celebrating her life, you know them. She loved the Lord. She loved this church. She loved her family. She loved life. I know she loves heaven, and I look forward to seeing her again. I've known Betty for many, many years here in the church, even though she was a little older than me. But we sang in the choir, she directed. She came to the school, taught Latin, when I was teaching the little children. So I knew her for a long time. But then I went up to Wiley, and after a while, Betty came up to Wiley, not very good. After a while, I would spend time feeding her, and she'd always look at me and smile. And if I talked to somebody else, she wasn't happy. But we would have, they would play hymns, 
and I'd say, Betty, I love that hymn. Now she wasn't talking, but she would open her mouth as if she was singing. She remembered, even though she couldn't talk, she remembered those hymns that she had learned and sung for many years. And it was a big blessing to me. But the last few times, it's been very sad to see her go down. But on Wednesday, when I talked to her, she turned her head, looked up at me, and then went back to sleep. When I went there on Thursday, she looked at me when I spoke. I said, Betty, I was in prayer meeting last night, and we prayed for you. She opened her eyes, which she hadn't been doing. She opened her eyes, looked up at me, and I knew that she remembered me. She knew my voice. She then closed her eyes and went back to sleep. A few hours later, she died. What a peaceful death she had. She had loved the Lord, she had served the Lord, and the Lord gave her a beautiful death. Well, I met Betty in 1992. I know, I'm trying, I've, obviously I'm well prepared. I didn't write anything down and I wasn't thinking of doing anything. I just thought I have to get up here and say something. And uh, so I actually met Betty the first time here at this church. Um, and it, I said 1992, I've got to get in the right year, 2011, I'll get myself straightened around yet, excuse me, you can see what Betty had to put up with me, between the two of us, we had quite a time, so 2011, I met Betty, and uh, there was a King James Bible conference going on here, and um, Betty had attended, and then after lunch, over in the other building there, Betty came up to me and she, she said, would you mind walking me across the way back to the church? I'm not sure if I can make it. I'm a little tired. Oh, I said, that's sure. I'll just clean up in the kitchen here. And she took my hand and we walked back here. And then when Pastor and Mrs. Waite, who live here in Collingswood, um, asked me to come back to Collingswood, I needed a place to stay. And there were I got a phone call saying, Anne Marie, the Lord's provided a place for you. Betty Morgan says she remembers you from July. And so in December, I drove up by myself from Canada to come back here, and I stayed with Betty. What an experience that was from the day I walked in, and the vacuum cleaner was sitting in the middle of the floor, and it had duct tape on it in three different places and I'm thinking oh this is this is interesting and uh, Bushy the kitty cat who's now with Peggy and Robert Bushy was sick Betty wasn't doing so well and uh, we just started off with a great time now who else would allow a stranger to come in and kind of set up room and housekeeping, literally housekeeping. Uh, I asked her what happened to her vacuum cleaner because I was going to just kind of move her. She said, well, it caught fire. I was trying to vacuum before you came. So that's all right. And that night, I, 
was helping her clean out her fridge, and it was speckled. It, the things in there, it was incredible, orange and purples and greens and blues, and she just let me do it, you know? And she sat on her sofa, and we, we were like girls at a pajama party, I'll tell you, two o'clock in the morning, just laughing away. And that, that was Betty. And then, so we had to get her a vacuum cleaner, and we went to Oric. Betty drove there. I didn't know she her license had expired at that time. <laughs> and so she's driving along, and people are honking, and, and she's just kind of going very slowly. And she said, well, I know it's around here somewhere. So anyway, we get a vacuum cleaner, and we get lost. It's now dark coming back, and, and it's near Christmas time. Betty has no idea how to get back home. And I said, but I put chicken on in the oven, and, and Bushy's there. Oh, dear. Three hours later, we finally found our way back to her place from Route 70. And of course, I'd never been there before. So anyway, but it, but we we had quite a time. And then there, uh, oh yeah, then I'm using her brand new vacuum cleaner, and I vacuum under her bed. Uh, what could there be, eh? All of a sudden, there's this squealing and screeching going on with the vacuum cleaner, and Betty's yelling, "Shut that thing off!" Well. I thought, what on earth happened? Back to Oric we go, and the guy said, nobody's brought a vacuum cleaner back the next day. And I said, well, something happened to it. So we took it apart, <laughs> and for the dust that was under the bed, I didn't know that there were clothespins under there, too. And the clothespin had got caught up, and, and uh, so anyway, we, we've had lo we had a lot of fun. Miriam was a wonderful friend, being able to go and visit her and Jill every Friday, shopping, and, uh, and that was always a good time. And uh, Miriam sitting on her sofa at her home and, and reading the Bible to Betty, and they were just the very best of friends. And then Peggy and Robert show up, they're cousins from Pennsylvania, and I think, wow, this is fantastic. Well, Betty already had the restaurant picked out she wanted to go to, and she would open the gifts that, that Peggy and Robert brought, and she enjoyed them so much, she put them all back in, in, in the bag, the gift bag, and then she'd take them out again. Well, Anne Marie, let's look at these gifts again. So we had Christmas lasting about a week at, uh, at her place. And then um, uh, she ended up coming to Canada with me for two months when she was 92 years old, couldn't get travel insurance, couldn't get any health insurance for over there. But um, the doctor asked her if she wanted to go, and off we went, kind of like the Beverly Hillbillies type thing. And, and uh, so she was there for two months with me, and we and came back. So Betty, Betty had opened her home to me. She was a, just a wonderful friend, and uh, just, it, the fun, the times that we've had, um, the the times of reading scripture together at after breakfast, and hearing Betty play her piano, and I said, "Oh, Betty, just sing!" and and she had that beautiful soprano voice, and going through some of her her um, personal things like papers that she had, there was a, like a a little program of the Messiah. And Betty's going through it with me. And I said, Betty, your name is here. You sang alto. How could that be? And she said, oh, I always sang alto until one day I came over to the piano and I decided, oh, I'll hit a high C. And, and she, she went bang and she said, oh, I think I'll sing piano. I'll, I'll sing soprano now after plucking it out on the piano. And that's what she did. So she had this beautiful angelic soprano voice and at Wiley people love to hear her singing and uh, and it just carried on and so yes being choir director and how she would pick out the hymns and there was you people in the choir when she was getting a little older and wasn't um, planning quite as much she said I think we'll sing was it Alleluia or in and, and, I said, oh, how does that go? So she would sing it, but it's only one word. 
in the whole thing. And, and then a couple weeks later, she'd say, well, I think I'll have the choir sing, hallelujah. I'm like, no. So anyway, she's, she put some thought into it, and she sure appreciated all of you. But yes, the Lord was gracious. And um, Randy and I coming back, and near the end of November, we're able to go and see Betty every Sunday at Wiley and, and have a program of singing. And, uh, and it was uh, a really extra special time. So Betty was a joy. And thanks to Peggy and Robert and Susie. Susie would cook meals when she would go to Betty's. That one meal with, oh boy, it was excellent. And all the travels. And Peggy was always, um, sometimes, quite often, Betty called Peggy Helen because Helen was a cousin that she traveled with and just loved dearly. And so that love was transferred to Peggy with no problem. So anyway, thank you. I think you probably can hear me. I know from my big mouth. Um, I was an infant. I was not a Morgan until I married her. But Betty was really into genealogy. She knew everybody back from 1731 when George Morgan settled over in Washington Township for a place and built this school and bought this stone house. So you know, she knew George and David and David and David, not Woodbury, not Woodbury, Raya, and you know, they were all David except I got Bob. But um, she really, really was into it and she got me into it. And we enjoyed visiting the house in Washington Township, house on the Cooper River that I'm working at, David Uriah Madden. And it was something that brought us together and I truly enjoyed it. Talk about it, and she'd say, Now you know that this person did this, and you say, No, well, I do now. So it was really, it was so much fun getting to know her, and we felt so blessed that God gave us the opportunity to come and to work with her, to help her, and to learn to know her better, and to learn from nice people. And Marie, and Jill, and Miriam, and Shirley.
And I look back on that now and I realize what an idiot I was to not pay better attention. But you know, I, I knew her a long time after that when I did have that appreciation.
no small part of that. And, and you know, I've heard a lot of things about the personal aspects of it, but her work there would use the plot for many, many people to come across. So thank you very much. Are there others who would like to say something? If, if so, we do encourage you to the mic because we're recording this to give a CD to the family. Anyone else? All right, let's go ahead and take our hymnals then and turn to number 147, How Great Thou Art. You may remain seated and we'll sing all of the verses. 147.
all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God's word of comfort from Psalm 23. The Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Though I anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Please take your hymnals and turn to number 705. 705. It is well with my soul. You may remain seated to sing. 705.
God has given us many great and precious promises. Some of those which are most beautiful and most loved are his promises of heaven. Revelation chapter 21 and 22. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the first of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, and unbelieving, and the abominable, and the murderers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was of the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Lest it is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is the first, Come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly, Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. A beautiful childhood hymn that Betty loved is number 185. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. We'll remain seated and sing all three verses.
we know the Bible tells us so. God has provided a way to heaven. It's a unique way. It's a singular way. It is the only way. And Jesus tells us of that in John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am now there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. Amen. And now we have special music, a hymn that Betty loved, The Solid Rock, Randy and Anne Marie Hattyshell. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, Randy and Anne-Marie. The glory of the resurrection. Our text is 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 35. And as we look at this, though we have sorrow in our hearts now, we have guaranteed joy and assurance of the future. We've heard memories of the past this morning, delightful memories about Betty, we have the reality of the present before us, but our focus today is on the glorious future which God has prepared for those who love him. Tears, weeping, crying, and sorrow are mentioned 747 times in the Bible. There are hundreds of more references to suffering and pain and agony and hurting and death and grief. Even our Lord Jesus Christ wept at the grave of Lazarus in John 11:35, weeping, and yet it is the shortest verse in the Bible. Tears and sorrow are woven throughout all of Scripture from the Old Testament to the New Testament. But why does it have to be? Tears and sorrow are a reminder to us that we are all descended from Adam and suffer under the burden of sin and the curse that was placed on the entire human race. We're especially reminded of this at a time when a beloved friend, a beloved cousin, a beloved sister in Christ steps out of this life and into the next. Death brings sorrow to those of us who are still here in our mortal bodies. But for the Christian, it is sorrow mingled with joy. It's sorrow eased by guaranteed hope. It's sorrow overwhelmed with glory. Our scripture text for today in 1 Corinthians 15 reminds us of that. 1 Corinthians 15 is the great resurrection chapter of the Bible. But some may well say, how are the dead raised up? And 
With what body do they come? <laughs> thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is reaped in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Incredible truths that the Apostle Paul gives to us here in this passage. The Bible compares the glory of our resurrection bodies with three things. Number one, it appears, uh, uh, compares us here in this passage to the amazing plant kingdom. The seed produces many times more than the one seed that dies in the earth to reproduce. In the same way, the resurrection body will be far greater and more productive than we can ever imagine. This is not a statement of reproduction and physical generation. It's a statement that we will be able to reach the full potential for which God in his love originally designed us to be. All through my life, I encourage my children, reach your full potential. Be all that you can be that God designed you to be. None of us ever reach that here. But this illustration that the Apostle Paul gives to us is a statement that each of us, God has designed each of us to reach the full potential for which God in his love originally designed us. That's true with Betty. You spoke of all the talents that she had, all of the, the marvelous gifts that God gave her, her zeal, her dedication, her drive, her commitment to Christ, her service and many times humble service at that. Her love for music and think of what the music in heaven is like right now. The many years that she served as the choir director here at this church. Betty Morgan. Never married, never had children, so she dedicated her entire self to Jesus Christ. The seed has been planted. What is the plant? now producing in its greatest extent of capacity and glory. The second thing that the Bible compares the glory of the resurrection with our bodies in the resurrection is the incredibly diverse and complex animal kingdom. He speaks of the flesh of fish and fowl and mammals, and it's all different. The composition of the resurrection body will be different in some manner from our current bodies. But it will be real. It will be tangible. But it will not function on the same life support system because the Bible tells us flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And yet it will be real, but it will have different properties. Jesus appeared in his resurrection body to those who are in the upper room with the doors bolted and he walked through and stood in their midst. And they were frightened. And they were afraid that they'd seen a ghost. And Jesus said, fear not. A ghost does not have flesh and blood as you see me have. Handle me and see. And he said to Thomas, Thomas, you doubter. 
He probably even grabbed Thomas's hand because Thomas was shrieking back and he said, reach hither thy finger and thrust it into the print of the nails and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing. What an amazing body that will be. Our resurrection bodies. The third thing the Bible compares the glory of our resurrection bodies with is the awe-inspiring glory of astronomy. There are different levels of glory in the resurrection. Now remember, this was written 2,000 years ago. And yet God had made the universe and God revealed these things to the Apostle Paul. There are different levels of glory in the resurrection just as there are different levels of glory between the earth, the moon, the sun, the stars, and even the stars differ in glory. Those who have faithfully served Jesus Christ will receive glorious heavenly rewards. Some are more faithful than others and will have a greater capacity to reflect the glory of God throughout all of eternity even as the moon reflects the sun. But all of those who are God's children, and Betty is among them, will shine forth the praise of their great God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. We're then given four ways in which the resurrection body surpasses our current body. Number one, it will no longer be subject to to decay. That's perhaps the thing that troubles us most as we think about death in this world. We do our best to preserve the bodies. They're made beautiful by the funeral directors. But our bodies are subject to decay. But we've just read that the resurrection body will not be subject to decay. The second thing that's promised us in verse 43, it will no longer be subject to dishonor. Growing old, growing unattractive, losing mental abilities, losing physical abilities, being surpassed by those who are younger. The body is sown in dishonor, but, Paul says, it is raised in glory. There's no one alive on the face of the earth today in all their beauty and all of their honors that can compare with the resurrection body that will be given to the believers. Think of the most handsome man you can think of, the most beautiful woman you can think of. They are not compared with the glory, the honor that we receive in our resurrection bodies. The third thing Paul also tells us in verse uh, 43 is it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. We'll no longer be weak, we'll no longer be feeble, we'll be no longer being pushed in wheelchairs. Our body will be strong, our body will be powerful. The fourth thing that he tells us is verse 44. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. Not raised a spirit, raised a spiritual body. And Paul makes a point of that when he says there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. It will no longer be subject to the temptations and the lusts of this world. The natural body is subject to all of those temptations. It will become a spiritual body. The Bible gives us further promise in Romans chapter 8. Beginning in verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, an heir of God. All of you have probably inherited something at some time or another. And you've inherited maybe a lot or maybe just a little bit. But we are called heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. What belongs to Jesus? We're joint heirs with him. But he goes on, If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. 
1 Corinthians 15, back again. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of the eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. The Bible promises that someday there will be an end to death itself. There is coming an end to the weeping. There is coming an end to the sorrow. There is coming an end to the suffering and the pain. And we read it just a moment ago in Revelation 21. But do you remember verse 4? God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death. For the former things are passed away. That hope is grounded in solid historic fact and in one person, our Lord Jesus Christ. Without him, we are without hope. John 11, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Oh, the great and precious promises of Jesus. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Do you have that life this morning? Do you know for sure that if you were in this casket in place of Betty Morgan, that the real you would be in heaven with Jesus? There is coming a day, if our Lord tarries, when you and I when we will be in a casket like this, probably at the front of some building, either a funeral home or a church. But that's not really us. That's the shell we used to live in. But the real you will be somewhere. And there are only two places according to Scripture. Either you will be in heaven with Jesus Christ, or you will be in hell. And there is no exit there. Betty, we know for sure, is in heaven because she trusted Jesus Christ. But what about you? You know, you don't have to go to that place of fire and torment and darkness. Jesus has made a way for you. He compares himself to a door in John 10. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. That's an invitation to you. But you must have the proper response. You know, there are many ways to respond to an invitation. Many ways to respond to a claim. There can be anger or bitterness or rejection or apathy or carelessness or scorn or amusement or doubt and a host of others. But there is only one correct way to respond, to receive the gift of eternal life. Many had departed from Jesus 
And then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Some of you here today may just go away. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and art sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Trust him. If you don't know for sure today, make this the day of your new birth. Trust Jesus alone. He died for you. He was buried. He rose again from the dead on the third day, guaranteeing that his offer of eternal life is true for all those who believe and accept his gift of life. Where is Betty Morgan today? The Bible tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. She came to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith because the Bible tells us without faith it is impossible to please him. And we likewise come by faith. Faith in the one who loved us and who gave himself for us. We have a God who never lies. And he's told us what we need to know to comfort our hearts on the two critical issues. Number one, the reality of heaven. And then number two, precisely who will be there. Those who have trusted him alone for eternal life. Have you trusted him? Have you believed on Jesus Christ alone? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, and Betty is among them, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then beautiful verse 18, which is for us today. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Those words were designed as words of comfort because they also had lost loved ones. Betty Morgan trusted Jesus Christ alone to save her from her sins. Betty was not relying on her personal goodness or her baptism or her tithes or her church membership or the benevolent love for her family to get her to heaven. She had trusted in Jesus Christ alone to give her eternal life. And that, dear friends, is how we know for sure that the real Betty is in heaven today, even as I speak. And that's how we know for sure that she has no more suffering or sorrow or pain. Jesus promised to prepare her mansion in the skies, and a few days ago, he finished preparing that mansion precisely on time. As our dear sister took her final breath, she reached out and took the hand of Jesus, who looked her in the eyes and said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And I suspect he may have also said something like, Betty, welcome home. Come see the beautiful place that I've just prepared for you. And it was the most beautiful place that she had ever seen. But she couldn't take her eyes off Jesus. The nail-pierced hands that were holding her hand. The wounded side where he held her close. The gentle kindness as she gazed into his eyes and saw his infinite love for her that sent him to the cross in her place. The Jesus whom she trusted from childhood. That's God's grace. Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone is Betty in heaven. Yes, there is no question. Because of the grace of God that drew her to trust in Christ alone. Will you see Betty again in heaven? 
Yes, emphatically, but only if you have trusted in Christ alone to save you from your sins. The one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. She trusted him. She is there. If you trust him, you will be there too. Remember that promise? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the great and precious promises of Scripture. And what a glory to know that our sins have been forgiven through the blood of the cross. That we know it is true because Christ rose from the dead and appeared to more than 500 people. And we have accurate historical records and people who gave their lives because they had seen him and they would not deny him. Thank you, Father, that you give to our hearts comfort in this hour of grief. Father, I pray for each of Betty's cousins. I pray that you will give them the grace and the strength and the mercy to know that one day they too will see Betty again when they come and stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, when they see him. Father, I pray for your special comfort to Bob and Peggy Morgan and to John and Janet Morgan and to Imgard Morgan, to Deborah Smith, to Mary and David Morgan, to Bill Morgan. We pray for each of these cousins, Father, that you will give them the comfort that they need in this hour of grief. We pray, Father, for those who are dear friends here who loved Betty so much, who had so many good times with her, who walked with her, talked with her, sang with her, sang in the choirs that she directed, went on trips with her. A lady who had a spunk and a zeal for life. And now she's more alive than she was ever alive here on this earth. Father, we thank you for that. We also pray, Father, that you will bring us to our senses and away from the frivolity of earth to realize that the day of our own death may be soon. That we might consider and take account of what we're doing and where we're going so that when that day comes we might step with joy into the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that it might not be a moment of fear might not be a moment of doubt I pray that everyone here in this room and those listening over the internet and those who perhaps will see this service in the future, the Father, each one might trust in Christ alone, the one who bought us with his blood and who rose from the dead, proving his offer of salvation is true. And so, Father, we commit all those who still are here living to you, that each one of us might make sure that we're right with our Lord Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 769. We'll stand to sing all the verses. Oh, that will be glory for me. 769. Let's stand to sing.
God to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, now and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, and John, if you'll come forward and give instructions.